all Alex. Thank you. So um, we're going to start our lightning talks off. Um, and if again, if you have any questions for the lightning talk speakers, we I'll, I'll provide an actual provide a schedule right now. So um, each lightning talk will be about 10 minutes. And at the end, we'll have about 20 minute um, audience questions. So if you have any questions, please feel free to send them to Susie Wilson. You can direct message her through the chat. And then um, I'll be asking those questions to the Lightning Talk speakers. So the first Lightning Talk speaker is Joyce Wong. Um, she uses she, her pronouns, and she's from Langara College. So I'll stop my share. And um, do you, uh, Joyce, do you have access to, can you share your screen right now? Because I believe you have some slides. Yes, um, looks like I can share, and I just want to make sure that I can, can you hear me okay? Okay, perfect. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, just one second. Okay, so I'm just going to move this over. Okay, can everybody see the screen? Okay, so thank you very much for having me today. Um, so um, I just want to talk a little bit about a decolonized project uh, I did with the Art History Collection. So I'm going to use the journey metaphor, um, if that's okay for everybody. So, you know, every journey has a trigger or a spark moment, and mine has been brewing for a while. As an art history librarian, it really poked my eye that so many titles about Indigenous art and cultural production are classed under the history of North America as ethnographic studies. So, for example, this title here, Trickster Shift, is clearly about contemporary art practices, but is classed in the ease. And, you know, of course, to make our students studying South Asian art, and many of whom are international students, even more confused, there's that ubiquitous colonial subject heading Indian art dash Canada versus art dash India. So that's kind of what uh, sparked my journey. And, you know, I start off on the tourist route. Um, you well, know, my, I try hi, to look for best practices. Hi, Joyce. Yeah, I just want to let you know you're showing your uh, speaker notes rather than the oh the slides. Sorry. I'm not sure if that is sure. intentional or not. I thought I could. Oh, here we go. Is that better? Uh, yeah, that's okay. Fine. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> I th I thought I practiced this, but it didn't quite work out. Okay, great. Thank you for letting me know. So, um, to continue, so I start off on the tourist route. Uh, I tried to find best practices and hopefully make some recommendations, right? My questions were, how can we decolonize our descriptive practices uh, to reflect the discipline in, of art history? Uh, and where's the best place to, in some ways, part these titles about Indigenous art? But to, qual to qualify first, I'm not a cataloger. And at that point, I was only interested in the print art collection. And so, you know, I also checked off the regular tour stops. So I did literature review, I did interviews, um, I did an environmental scan, but what really emerged along the journey was how insular my process was. Um, this was especially poignant when I spoke with indigenous scholars and artists and emerging from, emerging from my readings and conversations um, with faculty and scholars that while we, the library can take some steps to change our descriptive work, it isn't about finding that perfect set of classification or subject headings. Um, furthermore, it, isn't also no, it is also not about an overarching set of concrete steps that can be applied to all contexts. Uh, on, you know, on a practical level, um, copy cataloging and vendor records meant that our records could never really be cleansed. And, and, you know, and the question is, why should we cleanse our records? As noted by one of my faculty interviewees, the Indian Act still exists, and that word should not be deleted until that act is repealed. 
So on a philosophical level, uh, complete erasure of outdated and offensive cataloging work does not take away our responsibility to engage in challenging conversations around decolonization uh, and to redress systematic inequities. So for example, changing the subject heading for a book on totem poles to indigenous, uh, to indigenous art does not address the colonial view by which indigenous cultural productions is often discussed. So for me, the response uh, lies in nurturing local and specific relationships to support indigenization in the curriculum at a diffuse level. So individual, class, project, and departmental level. I mean, part of the problem I notice is that in our profession is the desire to apply universality and standardization, whereas land, relationships, and community are so important to Indigenous frameworks of knowledge. And so how does the library and the role of information provider and collection curator support decolonization and indigenization of the curriculum when land relationships, relationships and community are so foundational to Indigenous knowledge, uh, especially when colonial practices have tried to homogenize and erase unique Indigenous communities? So, you know, I don't have, of course, um, the answers and not, not everyone does, but here are some of my journey snapshots. And I believe that commitment to dialogue and engagement with our direct communities should frame up the approach. One that can be applied to all aspects of our work. So including collection management, provision of services and information literacy instruction. So for example, um, as a result of this journey, I created a guide on indigenous art, which attempts to provide a context for the colonial history of our organizational scheme and to link to the voices of communities that is responsible for this cultural production. So oftentimes, um, library guides are just links to resources we have, but what if we link to the wider context, right? Um, the study of art and cultural production is not a major part of the curriculum in our Aboriginal Studies program at Langara. But in contrast, the art, Fine Arts Department consciously incorporates decolonization uh, into their curriculum. So examples of their efforts include uh, an Indigenous carving course, and the inclusion of BIPOC artists in their speaker series. So within the Langara context, it makes sense then to reclass many titles about indigenous art and artists from the E's to the N's. And, and for this project, I, didn't, I have identified about 40 titles to be moved. And I'm not suggesting that the ends of the perfect parking stall for these titles. Rather, um, the effort is to prioritize the subject where there's likely most interest and use amongst our, our users and faculty. Um, you know, and the best journeys don't often have destinations, and, and this is my case as well. Uh, moving forward, I hope to showcase and highlight primary Indigenous voices, especially those shared with permission, uh, especially in new formats, so podcasts, interactive story work. Um, there is a rich um, growing resources there. I'm going to engage with students um, when I'm, whenever I'm teaching to talk about authority and context, um, and of course I would hope to um, maintain an active role in supporting indigenization curriculum efforts on campus. I'm currently auditing a course in indigenous knowledge that's been very transformative. You know, and as Carleen mentioned, this work takes time. And um, I'm one of those people who like to just, you know, identify goals, get things done. And doing all this work has really emerged for me that I need to take a different approach. Then I need to start conversations by saying not, how can I support your curriculum, but really start with a check-in. This is where I am. Um, what are you up to? Um, listen and really let the conversations flow. And then hopefully um, some impactful actions specific to my community can then um, take place. So that's it. Thank you. And I will stop sharing. Oh, hi, uh, everyone. Sorry, I was I was muted. Um, so I think the next speaker is Catherine Waterber. Um, so I'm not sure if you have slides or not, Catherine. I, I don't have slides. Um, my last name is Watmo. 
Okay. Sorry. It's always a tough one. I have to spell it everywhere I go. <laughs> I have a I have a speech impediment, so it's really <laughs> it's really hard for me to say some. Things. So thank you for letting me know. No worries. Uh, okay, so um, first I would like to say hello from uh, the traditional lands of the Sequetmic um, within Sequetmic Ulu. Um, uh, TRU is in Kamloops, BC. Um, and it is um, the traditional territory um, where uh, learning and research has been happening for thousands of years. Um, so what I'm going to uh, talk about firstly is um, uh, TRU's Coyote Project. So what is um, the Coyote Project? It is um, a group of um, nine faculties plus TRU World Open Learning um, and the library, um, a project that uh, is about creating a campus that is welcoming and supportive to all, especially in due Indigenous um, students and staff. Um, it's a five-year project um, that is funded by um, a, a million dollar per year uh, pan-institutional um, program um, to accelerate indigenization. Um, uh, and uh, the, the goal is for it to have um, a long-lasting impact. Um, the, so the library is involved in that, and I'll share a couple of links in the chat after if you want to read more about the Coyote Project and about the library's um, work um, in particular. Um, so what is um, the library doing um, towards indigenization and um, and um, talking more about reconciliation. Um, right now we are working on a couple of projects in cataloging, um, adding place names to catalog records. Um, we are doing some indigenous author cataloging as well too. So adding that subject term um, to make indigenous authors um, searchable. Um, and we are integrating uh, the updated uh, Canadian subject headings um, to our records. And we are using the Indigenous Subject Authority list that comes from AMA um, Maine um, in Manitoba. So that's, uh, we're getting some guidance from those documents there. Um, one of the other things that we are uh, doing, um, we are creating a maker space. Uh, it's not currently open, but it will be in January. And um, the hope is that we will have many initiatives with Indigenous education. Uh, currently, they, Indigenous education does host um, a lot of um, um, interactive, hands-on um, art classes uh, to create um, materials. And um, we are hoping that the makerspace, makerspace can be involved in, um, in that in a, a, a bigger way. Um, uh, we have uh, just moved to a new building. And um, so we've created some indigenous spaces within um, our new building. Um, so we do have uh, study rooms set aside for indigenous students. Um, the building also hosts the elders lounge. Um, so that's on the first floor. So uh, people can come and gather in the space as well. We've um, added indigenous language signs um, in the library. Um, the staff have uh, been taking um, indigenous and reconciliation MOOCs, um, the one from University of Alberta and ones from UBC. Um, and uh, so most staff were required to take one of those um, two MOOCs about um, reconciliation. And we also hosted um, some staff lunch and learns um, around uh, CBC's eighth fire. And um, um, I saw that Jesse Lampro was one of um, the people here today and she had a lot to do with um, hosting those programs. They were um, very interesting and informative and there was some discussion around those too. So. 
And um, we also this year received some funding from the Coyote Project to hire two Indigenous student ambassadors in the library. That's a first um, for us to have um, ambassadors in the library, um, but we felt that when um, we came back from COVID um, shutting down from that and because we were in a brand new space um, that it would be helpful to students to um, have student um, ambassadors on the first floor to just kind of help people navigate the new space. And we were lucky enough to be able to hire um, two positions out of the, out of the six um, that we had um, as indigenous um, students. So um, we were very happy to be able to do that. And um, that is all I have on that. So thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Okay, I think the next person is Zanya Free. And Zanya is an Indigenous Métis member of the Northwest Territory Métis Nation. She is a Master of Library and Information Studies graduate student at the University of British Columbia's iSchool with a First Nations Curriculum Concentration Specialization. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree in art history with a minor in education from the history from the University of Victoria. Sanya currently works for the UBC iSchool FNCC program in a graduate research position titled Re-Envisioning the FNCC. So Zanya. Hi. Um, so Hi, I'm Zanya. having a little bit of technical difficulties a little bit here. Um, sorry. Nice to meet everybody. I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Musqueam people here at UBC um, Housing. Um, I'm here to share with you. Oh no, did I just freeze? I'm back. Hi. Uh, is it freezing on me again? Uh, you're, you're back now. <sighs> okay. Um, I would like to talk to you, since this is a quick lightning talk, just a little bit about my research. Um, if I could share just a link in the chat and perhaps if, um, in the future when you guys have 14 minutes, you can watch a video that I made. Um, the research that I did is a 14 minute video uh, speaking about the Indian in the cupboard. Everyone knows about this book. It won many awards in the 1980s. Um, it's written by Lynn Reed Banks, who is not an indigenous person, who speaks about in, an indigenous an Indian and um, makes claims that he's magic from the past, from history, which is why I'm concerned about books like these that um, gain a lot of momentum and popularity in the past that have won awards, um, so have been promoted. And um, since this is from 1980s, there have been generations that have gone by that have um, read um, words that are derogatory about the Indian, words that are not um, the language used in here, allows, makes one think that this is authentically spoken about, that some of the research is, is true to fact. Um, and then also doesn't allow the character to have an authentic voice as in it's not written by a person who is Indigenous and so the identity of the indigenous person is then therefore formed by an, the other. And that's, so this is sort of a colonial perspective of an indigenous person. And my research is focused on finding another way to see reconciliation as an opportunity to have an actionable response. So my actionable response as librarian and, and educator is to consider, what does this book say? Um, as librarians and educators, we need to ask, what do, library, what do children learn from the text? And so by doing a close reading of the Indian of the Cupboard, it demonstrates stereotypes as that's how it was, which encourages readers to believe in such films as fact. So this text is a colonial perspective, therefore the Indian is the other. Identifying this when considering books that are written by authors that are not indigenous gives agency to the voice of of an identity for another by another. So defeats the purpose. 
I believe that if we could shelve these two books together, The Indian in the Cupboard, along with My Land Song, I'm sorry about this video, not being able to show the, the book, that if we could shelve these together, it would be an opportunity for educators to take a look at the stories that are presented in here. Since this is a longer text, I think that instead of banning books, we should learn from them. We should have an opportunity to take a look at these, this kind of language and then discuss the kind of actual history and spoken from an author who is Indigenous and who has done some research about the people who have lived during the time that are spoken about in this book in particular. Um, what I'm trying to say is I think that reconciliation is an opportunity for librarians to take a look at what we have on our shelf, to take a look at what what language is being used and how people are being spoken about by other sources that are not authentic to the culture that is being spoken about. And so um, <clears throat> I wanted to share uh, <clears throat> an excerpt from my video, but I'm not really sure, um, do I have two minutes of time to share a short part of my video? Could I screen share? It yeah, you have enough time. Okay, I'll just, um, I'm linking to my video, which is called Rethinking the Canon. Um, it's a contemporary response to the savage Indian in the, in the cupboard. It's located at UBC's library. And choosing this screen, I'm hoping that it'll just open to this one. Oops. Um, why is it not large? Darn it. Are you still there? I don't see anybody. We are, we're still here. All right. To learn from it by recognizing its demeaning language as an example that situates the text in a time when cultural prejudice was socially acceptable. The fantasy of the story is evident, for the cover invites kids to question why the little Indian is holding a key on a huge hand, and then you realize it's about a toy coming to life and say no more, kids are bound to be interested. The book is intended to be fantasy, yet the language leads one to think the Indian voice may be true to history. Oh, what happened? Sorry, guys. <laughs> I think it's my mouse. It's very sensitive and... I accidentally pushed a button, story. Anyway, the point is, is that um, I just wanted to, I just wanted to share the video and um, a portion of it was that identity is, is an important issue to me because I've learned just through lived experience that um, there is so much that you have to do on your own to prove who you are when everybody else believes something other than what you do. And a lot of that is formed by stereotypes um, and years of colonization and propaganda and wrongful resources, resources that speak derogatory language about Indigenous people. And so we find that we are inundated with this, these false beliefs. And we have literature on our shelves that share derogatory language about indigenous people um, that we can't stop, that have been out there for so long that people believe them. And so I believe that it's our opportunity now as librarians and as educators to take the time to find books like this and to, find ways to change or to provide an alternative perspective. That is an authentic voice of an indigenous voice person or group to refute the information in the book. By sharing knowledge and resources together, we can learn um, 
the discrepancies, we can learn the differences between what is truth and what is fact, what is history and what is false, what is stereotype, and what is what we should be doing is um, learning from these things and not banning them. If we ban them and just throw them away, then we'll never know that they were even written and that that's how we might have formed these false beliefs. So it's by understanding our mistakes and by seeing that, that we can make a change as librarians by finding these, these books on our shelves and not just saying, oh, this is a bad book and just discarding it, saying, you know what, there are some things about this book, finding out where they are in the book. And that's what I did in my video. It's a 14 minute video. I know it's kind of long, but if you do have some time, try to watch it right to the end. Because at the very end, I put a little quote and it's after the um, credits. And that's, yeah, a creative choice of my own to leave you with something else at the end. But a lot of people haven't been getting that far. And I, I'd really like to point out uh, if you can get to four minutes, uh, three minutes and 50 seconds and four minutes and 19 seconds and five minutes and 30 seconds. Um, those times are where I'm talking about the books and the importance of having an Indigenous voice um, to counter the non-Indigenous voice that's speaking for an Indigenous person or peoples. Um, we just need to get through, we need to get, get uh, a we have to have a change made in how Indigenous people are viewed. Um, we need an opportunity to show you who we are. Um, for too many years, people have read information about Indigenous people, but you haven't heard it from our voices. You haven't read what we want to what, what we want to write about ourselves. And so, if you could just take a few minutes. Um, 15 minutes to watch my video when you're bored sometime and then think about you know other books you might have on the shelf and how you might be able to relate one book to another you know based on maybe the time period and that's kind of what I've done with my land song and with the Indian in the cupboard is I've looked at what time period they're talking about little bull being from and I countered it with this book <clears throat> which is also within the same time period or the same generation um, during the same French Indian War. And so <clears throat> this would give you a, a boy's perspective of a time period <clears throat> of a Indian who's magic from the past. And then this is actually the past that he's talking about. And this shows that they're not, you know, savage as this book claims. And so that's what I'm trying to say here is we can use our literature and our resources within the library to counteract these kinds of stereotypical voices with our own voices. And we can make things better by just through knowledge dissemination and through sharing in proper, in ways that will be positive and that will be a good um, way of showing who we are instead of allowing somebody else to share who they think we are. So that's all I wanted to share. And I hope, I hope that I haven't gone over my time. Thank you for having me today. Thank you, Zania. Um, I think we're all really interested in watching the full video. If you look through the chats, everyone's really excited. Um, and when you have a chance, please uh, put down the link in the chat so everyone can look at it. Um, and we'll make sure to share it through the um, in the later days with all the resources. Um, OK, so now we have another person. Um, uh, their name is Hillary Webb, and they use uh, she uses she her pronouns. And uh, Hillary is a systems and technical services librarian at Emily Carr University of Art and Design in Vancouver. So, um, and I think Hillary, you do have um, some slides to share. I do. Um, okay, and you're able to share. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Okay, you can see them, you can hear me. Um, I've tried to fit way too much into this presentation. I timed it at 11 minutes. I will try not to talk too fast though because I'll get nervous if I do that. Um, okay, I put my um, a territory, ter territorial acknowledgement on my slide um, to in the, in the interest of time. Um, okay, so in July 2020, a group of Emily Carr University students and alumni called the Anti-Racist Initiative presented a 31-page petition 
signed by 630 members of the community to the university administration demanding that they be held accountable for their lack of action in creating an environment free of oppression, racism, and white supremacy. Since then, the library has focused its work and actions through an anti-racist, anti-colonial, anti-oppressive lens. Um, my lightning talk will present a high level overview of our ongoing work and process as we learn to reframe the service and collections we provide to our community. We are in no means experts in this work. As Ashley Edwards said so nicely yesterday during the Keeping It Real panel, we are all learners on this journey. It's important to us that we're not working in a vacuum too. So that's why I offered to do a lightning talk today. Um, so this work is being done by every member of our library team. This is our whole team. So we're, we're a pretty small library. Uh, their work is integrated into this presentation. We're inspired and by and grateful for the many BIPOC librarians, archivists, theorists, artists, and writers whose work has guided us to learn about our own biases, question our directions, and unlearn harmful ideas from the Western education system, and change the library to be a more inclusive, reciprocal, and radical space. So when do we have these conversations? Uh, we started this work at our weekly staff meetings, but found it wasn't enough time to dig in. So we started planning longer sessions as a library team. So these were two plus hours. This past summer, our library team participated in three consultation sessions with the Commons, specifically Adeline Huen, Lily Callender, and Melanie Mattening. These sessions cover topics such as inclusion from the intersections, identity, privilege, and power, anti-racism, allyship, and belonging in the workplace, and inclusive leadership, connecting theory to practice. And then most recently in October, we had a library and archives planning retreat, which focused on our anti-racist work. And this consisted of smaller group conversations with three to four people. Oops. Oh. My mouse is being sensitive, there we go. Um, so I'm just gonna go over some of the documents that are currently uh, informing our work and how we're using these documents. So the first is our anti-racist initiative petition. So this document was a huge undertaking of labor done by a group of Emily Carr students and alumni and other stakeholders, um, not our administration. Um, I'll show you. So this is the spreadsheet that we're building. So as a library team, we took the list of demands included in their petition and created a document to share ideas of how we could act actively respond. At our weekly staff meetings for many months, we spent time working on the document together to fill out potential actions, accountability like staff assignments and timelines and related established and in process activities. Um, so some of the immediate internal changes that we made as a team after the document was distributed. For the sake of transparency, our library staff meeting meeting minutes became official documents, reflecting accurately what we were talking about in our meetings. We also created a group agreement collectively that outlines our terms of engagement for meetings, meaning our meeting logistics, our general terms of engagement, including the ways we communicate with each other. We offer the opportunity to revisit our group agreement at the beginning of every staff meeting. Um, um, okay, so the second document is the CIFLA Truth and Reconciliation Report and Recommendations. So on the CIFLA website, um, they describe the purpose of this document to promote initiatives in all types of libraries by advancing and implementing meaningful reconciliation as addressed by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report and the, in the calls to action. So similarly, uh, this report includes a list of recommendations. And we looked at the list and created a spreadsheet to outline each recommendation, ideas of how our library could respond and how we, how we will be held accountable. And then this work was rolled into our broader anti-racist spreadsheet. Um, we've just started looking at the Reclaiming Power in Place, the executive summary for the final report the National Inquiry into Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls. So we're looking at this document in our research help team meetings specifically with the goal of sharing a chapter synopsis at each meeting and reflecting on how we can integrate these learnings into our research help practices. So an example um, from chapter one, as was presented uh, to our group by Anna Diab, 
Centering Relationships to End Violence. This chapter introduced the concept of encounters, uh, which are times and spaces where values that shape a community are formed. Encounters have the potential to lead to harm or to healing. We thought about the university as a, uh, the university experience as a series of encounters and how fostering positive relationships uh, and encounters through our library service points could be a reciprocal healing experience for both the student and the service provider. And then the last one I'll mention um, is this white dominant culture and something different. So this is a worksheet, worksheet created by the ACCE and adapted from the work of racial equity trainer um, Tema Okan. And it was introduced as part of our commons consulting sessions. We were asked to look at some of the characteristics of white dominant culture and think about how they might apply in the context of our library. The worksheet then offers alternatives as something different. This activity sparked very meaningful conversations in our consultation session and again during our library planning retreat in October. Moving forward, this worksheet will be a key document to reframe our work, referencing these pivot points as we plan and strategize. So I'll, I just put an example up here. Um, one of the examples from the worksheet and some of the resulting thoughts stemming from the conversations. Um, so the, the norm of white, dominant cultures, individualism and separateness, and a focus on a single charismatic leader working in isolation from each other and from other organizations. We thought about how we could pivot to something different, being community and collectivism, working together, working from a movement lens and understanding that to change everything will take everyone. So some of the thoughts we had to do with this was uh, rotating chairs in all of our staff meetings to give everyone opportunities to lead we also have a library committee structure to work as teams um, on different projects and bring back conversations to the rest of the group. We explore how we are siloed, siloed from the rest of the university and where there is room for cross-pollination and collaboration. So an example of that is the Library Sustainability Committee is collaborating with the Emily Carr Climate Action Task Force with members from all areas of the university and then reporting back to the library team and we think about how the library can support their work. We've also been inviting representatives from the university areas to do presentations for the library team about threat assessment, student wellness and advocacy, accessibility and access needs. Uh, moving forward, we'll also be integrating the United Nations Declaration of, on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples document into our work. Uh, so I wanted to give some examples some of, of some of our current initiatives. Um, I had to take so much content out of this presentation. So this is, these are just three examples. Uh, so one is in our hiring practice. So this year, the university did a cluster hire faculty who identify as indigenous or as a member of a racialized group with approval from BC's Office of the Human Rights Commissioner. It was through this initiative that we were fortunate to have Vanessa Cam join our library team. This hiring process was done in partnership with BIPOC Executive Search who assisted in the crafting of the job posting and provided unconscious bias training for members of the search committees. An important aspect of this hire was considering how the library was going to offer ongoing support and mentorship opportunities for our new team member. We have a couple of recent um, research assistant positions. One was Beyond Black History Month in 2021 and um, another called the Anti-Racist Pedagogy Research Assistant position in 2019. So synopsis of the Black History Month, beyond Black History Month RA ship from Emma Summers. The student hired into the position, Liliana Martinez Castro has been exploring the university library and archi archives collections, focusing on the problematic racist history of our institution and tracing a narrative of student led anti-racist activism and response. This project is ongoing with the goal of publishing the outcomes in January, 2022. And in 2019, a student, um, Shade Alexis, worked with Anna Diab on an annotated bibliography of resources to describe best practices in anti-racist pedagogy. The, re the resources were compiled by faculty and students from the Social Justice Working Group and added to our resources for faculty libguide. And then the last initiative is developing policies and procedures that remove barriers to collection access. 
Um, there are more points to this, but some of the actions that support the initiative, including going um, almost completely fine free. We're offering free community board work cards to work groups on campus, such as security and cleaning staff, as well as indigenous community members in the lower mainland. We're working across campus departments with our and with our own service providers to ensure that patron chosen names appear accurately in our systems. And we're removing our security gates at the front of the library to create a more welcoming space. Uh, so just quickly, some stumbling blocks or things that we didn't expect when we're doing this work. One of the things we really wanted to do was to create a public facing accountability guide that outlined all of our work. That was and continues to be a bit of a stumbling block in some respects because we're really wanting to create a, re a respectful guide that doesn't come across as insincere or performative. Um, and linked to that is accepting that the work is being done in a really slow and thoughtful way. Um, and because we're referring to so many different documents, the work can feel overwhelming. Sometimes we enter our meetings and discussion sessions with a goal in mind. So for example, like creating that public facing accountability guide, and then we end up taking the conversation in another direction. And we choose to respect that instead of trying to um, be performative and trying to get work done. Um, and then also understanding that small things can make a big difference and taking small steps can add up over time. And then I put my contact information here. I'm more than happy to talk about any of these initiatives or if you're curious about other things that we're doing, uh, my email is there. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary, um, for that talk. And so now our final lightning talk is uh, by Sashni Lacey, the Learning Curriculum Support Librarian at UBC Okanagan Library, as well as the BCALS Chair. Um, and Sashni, do you have slides? I'm not sure if you do. I do, yes. Okay, and you're able to share, right? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Okay, folks can see that okay, I'm assuming. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great. Okay, um, so I'm gonna be talking about, uh, you heard from Carlene a fair bit this morning talking about the Indigenous Strategic Plan, which guides a lot of the work at UBC related to Indigenous initiatives. Um, and I have been chairing our implementation group at the Okanagan Library for our uh, branch. So I'm gonna be talking about some of the strategies and approaches that we've been using. Um, to implement such a big, robust document with a lot of different things in it. Um, so just again, my name is Sajni. I am the Learning and Curriculum Support Librarian, um, and I'm also the Subject Librarian for Indigenous Studies, which I share with my wonderful colleague, Christian Isbister, who just started with us in, um, in August. Uh, and I do just want to pause and, and take note that I do uh, live and work on the unceded um, ancestral and ongoing territory of the Silks Okanagan people, um, of which I'm a very grateful but uninvited guest here. Um, so UBC's Indigenous Strategic Plan is actually built um, upon kind of uh, formalizing UBC's commitment to acting on UNDRIP or the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, but also uh, really firmly grounded in the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Report and the TRC Calls to Action. Um, and there are eight goals within this plan with 43 actions. And it had input from more than 2,500 students, faculty, and staff across both campuses with the intent that it be reviewed every three years or so. And then an extra layer on that is at the UBCO campus because we have a different, you know, uh, physical land uh, context. There's also uh, the Okanagan has their own declaration of truth and reconciliation commitments, of which there are five. Um, so this is just to kind of position this document with which we're we're grounding this work in. So we started our ISP implementation group in the Okanagan in December of uh, 2020. Um, mostly the, <clears throat> sorry, ISP came out in the fall, and so we were kind of gearing up to do some work with this. Um, and so we formed in December, and we sit under UBC Okanagan's Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee as one of their subcommittees. Uh, 
And we very intentionally uh, asked for participation across the whole library. So our kind of final um, makeup of our group is we have some librarians, we have some BCGU staff or QP equivalent staff, some professional staff, as well as um, a couple of students, one of whom is in the room right now, who was a student with us last year. Um, and we really wanted to make sure that we had um, as many representative voices in the conversation so that we were reflecting all of the work that happens at all different levels in the library. So we had some broad overarching goals for our group. One was to develop and cultivate knowledge of those foundational documents, uh, which is UNDRIP, the TRC Calls to Action, and the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Report. I'm going to talk in a second about the self-assessment tool that Carlene also mentioned this morning. Um, but one of the pieces around that self-assessment tool is kind of creating space and capacity for folks in your unit to really um, engage and reflect on those documents. And that was something that we felt was kind of missing in our context was opportunities within the library um, to do that. And then our next kind of overarching goal was to look at the ISP and identify as many opportunities to take action on those goals that we could. Um, and then also, since so many of them apply to kind of um, you know, that hierarchical, hierarchical structure of universities where we can't have a direct impact such as creating, you know, research chairs or things like that, but where we can support the work to make that happen or when people actually get hired into those kinds of positions. So I loved um, in Hillary's presentation, I saw some overlaps with what we're trying to do here and, and I got some ideas for some next steps. So we had this idea to do what we called an ISP brainstorm. Because it's such a big document, it's hard to unpack all in one go. So we scheduled these um, one hour meetings like every couple of weeks throughout um, the last academic year. But we would meet as a group, we'd spend a little time at the start kind of chit chatting and, and sharing resources of things we'd engage with that would relate to the ISP work. So webinars, articles, resources, people, things like that. And then we would um, review one of the goals and the actions within it, where we would kind of turn all of our cameras and mics off and then just do an active brainstorming in a Google sheet. Um, and this was meant to be like a pie in the sky. If we could have anything, what would we wanna see the library do to take action on these goals? And then we would come back for the last little bit of time and kind of look at what we had contributed, maybe refine some of those a little bit um, and add to them as needed. And then for the next meeting, we would review the previous goal and so on and so forth. Um, so this was really meant to just get our thinking caps on in terms of what did we want to see, knowing that we wouldn't be able to necessarily do everything. <coughs> um, the other idea that we had was doing a truth and reconciliation uh, calls to action reading circle. Um, and this was a joint kind of proposal with um, some colleagues, uh, Tamis Cochran, who was mentioned a lot this morning as well at uh, Huiwa Library, um, where we would bring together people in a Zoom space and we would do a live reading of each of the calls to action and then create some space within that, in that live reading for some discussion and reflection as well. One of the things that we talked about, uh, like I mentioned before, was about creating that space to engage with these documents. Um, along with our work on the Indigenous strategic plan so that, you know, one of the challenges, um, and Carlene talked a bit about this this morning as well, was how do we move forward while still creating the space to engage with these really important documents so that we, we have some knowledge um, and some capacity to understand the context with which these documents are created. Um, so this hasn't happened yet. We're working on getting this up and running, but the idea would be that we, this would be the start of a whole series, that we would do something with the TRC, the live readings, then we would look at UNDRIP, then we would look at the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Report, and then we would probably cycle back through, that we constantly need to be looking at these documents, engaging with them, reflecting on them in terms of how they apply to our work, because as has been pointed out many times, we're all learners and we're all at different stages and this work is continual like we're, we're there is no uh end goal in a lot of ways we're always going to learn how to do better um and provide better for our the users that we're, we're talking about so this is kind of one st stage of that um so i mentioned uh, and i know carlene did as well the self-evaluation tool i just want to make sure i touch on all the points here i'm just looking at my notes 
Um, so in conjunction with the ISP is the self-evaluation tool that units can do to see how they're working or where they're positioned in order to start work on the ISP. And we wanted to make sure that we were also doing this really intentionally, that we weren't just saying, okay, everybody go do it. It can be done individually, it can be done collaboratively. Um, and what we have kind of come up with is a bit of a plan for how we're gonna engage with this. We're gonna start with our group, then we're gonna take it, um, take the main points away from it, have our library leadership do it, discuss it as a group, have our EDI committee do it, discuss it as a group, and then go to the whole library. So that we're kind of looking at the folks who are really actively engaged with this work all the time, getting some leadership buy-in and then building from there. Um, all with the idea of where are we gonna find those gaps and weaknesses and what we already have, how we already are doing our work so that we can move forward. Um, we also created a few more other smaller opportunities just to have that space to talk and be together in spaces. Um, and I'll pop, pop some links in the chat after while we have the question period. Um, but if you haven't heard of the series before, um, it's through UBC's Indigenous Initiatives Group um, called What I Learned in Class Today. And they had an original series several years ago that focused on Indigenous students' experiences at the university. And then they've done a renewed project that looks at faculty experiences. Um, and so there's about six discussion topics and themes with some uh, recommended readings and some reflection questions. And so over the summer, we ran a series where we met and talked about each of those themes and did the reading and talked about how it related to our work specifically in libraries. And a lot of that conversation connected with all of these things related to the ISP. Um, a couple other things that we've got going on. We just launched uh, in October with our colleagues at uh, Okanagan College. It is too bad Rachel Chong couldn't be here this morning because we are doing a group read of her tech, her book through Pressbooks, Indigenous Information Literacy. Um, and again, this is a collaboration between UBCO and Okanagan College. Um, and we're kind of pairing off with some uh, folks from each institution where we lead a discussion once a month on one of the chapters. Again, to think about how we can reflect this knowledge and this practice in our work. Um, and kind of like Hillary mentioned too, there's uh, definitely a need here to have some accountability and representing that this work is happening. And that was something that the student um, staff last year really made it clear to us is how important it is for not just this work to be happening, but for the community at our university and um, from our library to know that this work is happening. So we're just finishing up kind of a LibGuide, uh, which kind of talks about all of the work of the EDI committee and then all of its subcommittees to say, here's what we're working on. Here's who you can contact um, to let you you know, if you've got questions, you know, we're always looking for other ways to improve and just to kind of hold ourselves accountable for making that information public um, to show that that's what the library is engaging with. Okay. Sorry, I'm working on one screen here. Um, so there's a few next steps about what we want to do, and I just wanted to get a quick look at my notes. So we haven't quite finished the brainstorm yet um, of the ISP. We took a pause over the summer because our student staff weren't there and some of our uh, BCGU staff aren't there. So we're finishing that off this in the next couple of months, figuring out more of that role of the self-evaluation tool. UBC Vancouver has started their own ISP implementation groups. We want to be working closely with them. Um, we want to start having a formalized plan for how we're going to action some of the ISP um, and then create more of that space for those foundational documents. And ultimately, we're just trying to keep creating that space to learn, reflect, and be humble as we go through this process. And like Carleen said, be open to the fact that we're going to make mistakes and that's an opportunity for us to grow and do better. And I put my email address up there on the screen as well. I'm happy to take any questions or uh, share anything that we've, we've, we've been doing so far, um, but I will end it there. Thank you, uh, Sashni. So now um, we're gonna move to questions, audience questions for the Lightning Talk speakers. Um, so um, Susie, do you have any questions that you can um, DM me? Okay. So um, there's a question for Catherine. Can you talk more about what the Indigenous student 
um, ambassadors do? Are there similar positions in other campus departments? Hi, um, I'm unsure if um, what the other ca campus um, areas are doing. Um, we do have, in terms of indigenous student ambassadors, um, we do have um, student ambassadors um, from all over and um, they most are, are mostly comprised of, um, of international, international students, but they're also domestic students and um, possibly um, indigenous students as well. Um, so I, I don't know if um, the other areas are specifically um, looking for that, but we were able to apply to get some funding to have a couple of hires um, from the, the um, Coyote project. So um, other areas in the university may have done the same thing. Okay, great. And what specifically do these Indigenous student ambassadors do at the library? They, um, we have a desk that is down on the first floor in our learning commons. Um, so they help um, students kind of navigate the space and the campus as well as a whole. Um, so we, um, so they, uh, man the desk there and um, help students out um, when they come into the space and kind of um, uh, do directional um, service. Uh, that's great to hear. And then the other question, can you describe the study spaces that are de dedicated to Indigenous students? Are they bookable study rooms, a group study space, any unique features of the space? Um, we have um, two student spaces, um, one on the first floor and one on the second floor. They are only bookable um, by Indigenous students and um, our gathering place here on campus, uh, they have their own website. So there is a link on their website for those rooms um, and students can book those um, whenever they like. Um, we are still trying to get most of our rooms um, up and open um, because we're in a new space. It's it's taken a while for us to um, get the rooms kitted out, but they uh, do all have um, wireless uh, streaming TVs in there and other um, equipment like that, tables and chairs and things uh, of that nature for students. Um, and um, like I said, there, we have two of them, one's on the first floor and then and one's on the second floor for larger groups. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, um, Susie, are there any other questions for the, no other questions came in. So if, if other, if the attendees have more questions, please, please feel free to send them um, out um, or if, um, or if the, maybe if the panelists have want to talk to, or if the lightning talk speakers want to talk to each other about their work too, that could be really interesting. We might wait for another couple of minutes for people to send in questions. Sanji, can I ask you a question? Have you published your um, your lib guide, your accountability guide yet? Oh, that is a great question. It is published. I don't know how public it is, but let me just do a really quick look and I will post it in the chat if it is. Give me one second. Yeah, I'm curious. We're, we're still trying to figure out how to organize ours in a way. I think we're going to do it by service area in the library which is one of the reasons why the project kind of stalled. But um, yeah, I'd love to see it if you have it. If not, I've got your email. I'll send it to you once it's live. Thank you. Of course. Uh, 
Uh, Susie, are there any other questions coming in? No, I don't have any other questions that have come in. Okay. We could end, yes, we could end the recording. Um, uh, although I do think that we might want to include the BCAL's business meeting in the recording. Uh, what's your thoughts, Sajni? Oh yeah, sorry, let me just make a quick plug for that if that's okay. Um, so we have our BCAL's uh, winter meeting uh, starting at 1.30 and it's usually very low attendance for that one. Um, I promise it won't go super long. It's just an opportunity for folks who aren't on the executive um, to hear what we've been up to in the last year and also an opportunity for us to hear from you, um, you know, some feedback on the work that we're doing and just to hear what you all are doing at your institutions. Um, and, you know, I have a brand new puppy, so I'll bring the puppy to the meeting if that entices anyone to come uh, uh, so that they can see the puppy. But uh, it would be great to see some folks. I promise it probably won't take the whole hour, um, but it'd be really nice to see some, some, some people there. So thank you. Thank you for letting me do my spiel, David. Okay, that's great. I think um, I remember last year people really enjoyed the the very less formalized um, roundtable talks that were about the topic, but also not about the topic, just about your work in general, in working as like libraries during COVID. And now we are during COVID, but also working in person. So it'd be really interesting to hear from other people uh, from other institutions. So yeah. We should, we could turn off the recording.